We're nearing the finish of our deep dive into Dune by Frank Herbert. In this episode, we meet Alia for the first time and learn that she makes many of the Fremen around her uneasy since she speaks and carries herself like an adult, but looks like a young child. Meanwhile, Paul steps deeper into Fremen culture as he successfully rides a monster of a sandworm. There's also a lot of foreshadowing about a looming challenge between Paul and Stilgar. Join us as we unpack all of this and more on the Doctor Who Podcast. Hello and welcome again to the Doctor Who Podcast. My name is Chris. My name is Chip. My name is Brian. All right. So uh, before we jump into our discussion, we're going to take one minute to talk about N. Imerman Design Company. Nick Imerman has designed our logos, our logo variants, as well as all the overlays we use in the show. If you or anyone you know is interested in some graphic design work, we invite you to go to nimerman.com or visit him on Instagram at nimerman underscore design. Okay. So I think we're we're kind of getting to like the, the Sanderlanch portion of this book, I think. There's a lot happening. I mean, and it just keeps building. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, let's let's take a minute and let's each give our our thoughts. What stood out to us, and then we'll we'll jump right in and talk about those things. And Chip, you are up. So these these two scenes that we're going to cover tonight. I mean, it, they're not necessarily long, but there's so much that's kind of building in these. So we we meet Alia for the first time in person. And we understand that, you know, that the the Fremen are very unnerved by her because she's a she can't be two years old. I mean, we, we had a time jump of two years and Jessica was pregnant at that time. So I'm assuming she can't be two years old. She, she's maybe she's walking, barely walking or whatever. But she also speaks and has all this knowledge of a reverend mother and seems like an adult. So she's a very strange child. The other thing that happens here um, that is a bit of foreshadowing for some things to come. Uh, are these Fremen, a Fremen messenger arrives and tells Jessica that these young Fremen men plan to push Paul into challenging Stilgar for leadership of the tribe after Paul rides the sandworm, which is happening in the very next chapter. So, so we start to see this kind of power struggle building uh, between, you know, it's kind of the first seed that's planted between Paul and Stilgar. But then in the very next scene, after Paul rides the sandworm, there's more talk of him, you know, that the, the men are going to expect him to challenge Stilgar for the leadership of the tribe. So so there's a lot that is building in both of these scenes. So not necessarily, I guess the, the Sandworm ride is exciting, but not a lot of excitement, just, but like Chris said, you know, it's this whole, uh, we talked about Brandon Sanderson and other podcasts where the Sander Lanch is where everything just starts to pile up and starts to happen towards the end of the book. So it feels like, yes, we're definitely heading in that direction. Man, you got going there on Stilgar, and I'm like, I, I got to respect Stilgar. He's like a man of his people, and he just seems really down to earth. And unfortunately, there there were some words that were spoken where it was like, Stilgar knows what's coming, and he's like, well, it's the way of our people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Great. Uh, don't die, Stilgar. Anyway, um, yeah, to your point about Alia, this, uh, she makes the Fremen uneasy. She makes me uneasy, even reading <laughs> about it. I'm like... I would be totally freaked out if I saw a two-year-old putting those sentences together. And like, I actually had to go back and reread some of those sections twice because I was like, is there, a, is there like a grown adult? But like, it was written like it was an adult speaking. It was just really weird and unnerving. But uh, yeah, good job writing that because I, I couldn't sleep for a while after I read it. Um, but I also like the... Uh, again, I've mentioned this before on other episodes, but I like the the world building and I like the the ability to draw in just the feel of nature and like the big grandiose thing that is this desert sandworm and uh, like this great granddaddy sandworm that's been around forever that, you know, it's just like almost a symbolic gesture of where Paul is going, you know, like this this creature of of inevitability like the sandworm is always going to be there and so will paul like it just kind of feels like it's it just fits i really like that part um yeah another good section 
okay. So the I think it's unanimous that the the big takeaway from the Jessica and Alia section is Alia is creepy, impressive, and the whole premise is just entirely fascinating. Um, and there's some, oh, I'll get into it later, but there's this section where she talks about the time she awakened uh, when Jessica took the water of life, and that was just like, oh. Ugh. But um, the, another interesting part on this was Hera, who is James's wife, who became Paul's servant. Uh, there, there's some, there's some things with her and some of the, some developments that I found pretty interesting there as well. As far as she doesn't plan to be his servant forever, and she's found a new, quote unquote, opportunity. Um, and then, uh, Chip, I think you talked about this maybe in the last episode, but. I like the mechanics of the sandworm, like so what the hooks do, how you use them, how you like steer them and speed up the worm and things like that. So there's there's a lot of just fascinating things happening in these two sections. All right. Um why don't we just why don't we start with the Jessica and the Alia, Alia stuff? Ooh, where to where to begin unpacking this? <laughs> I mean, so first of all, uh, I it was interesting just the the introduction where where it's almost like there is a collective mind with the fremen. Mm. This was like they don't have telepathy, but they have this ability to kind of know the needs of their own people, and especially the Reverend Mother and um, how my wife would love the fact that. You know, she could be left alone and think about needing something, and someone, without saying a word, mm -hmm. will drop off what she needs and then walk away. Just, I thought that was kind of a, a fun that little. That is like um, an introvert's dream. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes, it is. But but Hera is with mm -hmm. Alia, and then uh, they're at like a baby shower. I think it's a birth. Yeah, birth. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose. But they've also they've also traveled deep into the south regions of Arrakis, where since Paul can't ride the sandworm, he the only way he could go there was to be carried on some like a palanquin or something or something you know, like some royal travel or means of travel that he can't go there. So, so I, I forget why they're there. Are they? Was it a safety I, measure to get away from? Yeah, I think they retreated that far in because the Harkonnen raids weren't going that far south. That's what. That's right. But um, yeah. So so like Hera has been basically like Alia's nanny from the sounds of it. Uh, but but like Alia being her is like she's she can be pretty nasty. Like she called, she called Hera, my brother's Ganima, which is something acquired in battle <laughs> with the added overtone that it's something that's no longer used for its original purpose. <laughs> I was just like, Ooh, I needed like that Kelso gif where he goes, burn. <laughs> like, that's, that's good. Um, but but yeah, Brian, you were talking about the them being at the birth, and mm -hmm. that was the reason that Hera brought her to Jessica was because she creeped out the Fremen, right? Well, and understandably so. I mean, she Ooh. comes back and she starts in on these sentences like, "Who is this two year old, and why is she talking?" Yeah. Well, and then the whole the whole birth part, though, where Alia had, like hidden in the birthing chamber or wherever they were, you know, and then she watched the baby being born, and then approached the baby while it was crying, and I don't know, she she didn't hold it, but she touched it, and all of a sudden the baby stopped crying, and it just weirded these people out to think, you know, that's when you it's like you know on the surface it's like yeah that's interesting, but then when you think that this is you know a two year old roughly. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who's probably the size of Baby Yoda, maybe a little bigger. But 
You know, <laughs> it's just that kind of mentality that it just it's unheard of. You know, it's so it's got to be unnerving to you know people to see this or witness well, this. And um, she apparently told people that the baby looked like the son of Mithas born before the parting. <laughs> like, beca- because yeah. she has mm. not only <laughs> this adult awareness, but she also has everything that every other Reverend Mother gave Jessica, she also has yeah. too. So she can see all the way back to the mm-hmm. beginning of the Fremen. And so when she does that, it's a little unnerving. But um, there was, was, okay, I wanted, there was a section I wanted to read here. Not a long section, don't worry. Um, But this is, oh, that was three. The Awakening, I'm guessing. Yeah, that was a good section. So, and albeit a little. I'm having Odd. problems turning pages. I'm almost there. Yeah, okay. So, she said, One day I woke up. It was like waking from sleep, except that I could not remember going to sleep. I was in a warm, dark place, and I was frightened. When I was frightened, I tried to escape, but there was no way to escape. Then I saw a spark, but it wasn't exactly like seeing it. The spark was just there with me and I felt the sparks emotions soothing me comforting me telling me that everything would be all right that was my mother um let's see just when I felt safe and reassured there was another spark with us and everything was happening at once the other spark was the old reverend mother she was trading lives with my mother everything and I was there with them seeing it all everything and it was over and I was with them and all the others and myself. Only it took me a long time to find myself again. There were so many others. I mean, yeah, that's just, it's a good thing that she like had some level of like awareness at that point, because could you imagine experiencing Mm -hmm. all of that and still having the mind of a child? Mm-mm. I mean, I don't want to experience it as an adult, but at least. Well, if I, you are a male, so it would destroy you if you had I that. I mean, that's, that is a good point, yeah. What a way to go. Unless you're the Quisette's Hatterack, I'm, potentially. I might oh, be. That's I might possibly, be. yeah. Good point. Yeah, yeah I think the, the line's kind of following that passage you read where Jessica talks about, you know, that's a cruel right. thing that happened to you and. It shouldn't have happened. And Ollie's like, I had no choice. It it happened. I, I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't shut it off. It just yep. it happened. Mm-hmm. But then she then Alia talks about how the benefit of it is that now the tribe has two Reverend Mothers. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they won't have to break in anyone for quite a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's weird. But it, it <laughs> there's a whole lot of potential there for Alia as a character as the story moves forward. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, the I think the last bit here, uh, and I don't remember if Brian said it or Chip said it, but the Fremen wives, the wives of Stilgar coming in and saying the, the warriors are going to go to Paul and have him challenge Stilgar if he successfully mm-hmm. rides the worm. Have him make a move, right. So, um, and, oh, I mentioned kind of the interesting thing with Hera is that it, I got from this that it, she is going to go be one of Stilgar's wives. So. Well, so I, I couldn't tell from the reading if she was going to be one of Stilgar's wives or if she was going to be, like, figuratively speaking with Stilgar's wife. So like it, there was... I, I couldn't really tell what yeah. that was saying. Let's see. I don't know if... Like, it sounded like they were going to have the same, like, the same leader, the same uh, person in their lives, but I couldn't tell if they were expecting Paul to win or Stilgar to win or, like, what was going to happen. Right. Yeah. 
either way, the two of them will be with the same person in a short mm-hmm. manner of time. Yeah, I'm trying to find the, the passage that I saw this. Yeah, okay. Yep, I, I'm not seeing it, so we won't dwell on it, but I, I thought I read that she referred to Thartar as like her sister. Ah, she knows we will soon be wives together, she and I, to share the same man. We have talked, Tharfur and I. We have an understanding. Mm. But is she talking about Stilgar there or Paul? Well, Tharfar is one of Stilgar's wives. I don't think it, Paul's going to yep. steal. But Hara's technically one of Paul's, not wives, but Paul's. Right, or, but so. it's, mm-hmm. it's been a so year, or so Stilgar, he can still they set both... her free, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if Paul kills Stilgar, then Tharthar would be Paul's <laughs> yes. property. That's not at all confusing. Mm. No. We could we could just do an episode way, discussing become... the Fremen socioeconomic ladder. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And well, how to climb that ladder. Actually, I'd love to put together a flow chart of would you like to be Stilgar's wife? No. How about Reverend Mother? <laughs> mm. And then you know, have the different career, the different chain down yeah. below. Yeah, uh, with my poor eyesight and old age, I wouldn't survive long in the Fremen world. Me either. <laughs> I mean, you're you're extra old now because you had a birthday this past weekend. So I did. Happy um, birthday! Yeah. Thank you. Twenty seventh birthday, twenty eighth birthday, twenty eighth. You don't 20, look, okay. You don't look a I day over sure. twenty three. Actually, almost nice. twenty five plus twenty five. I got <laughs> one more year before I get there. So. Folks, would you believe it that before the pandemic, Chip was actually 16? <laughs> yeah, I was I was Paul's age. <laughs> Speaking yes. of Paul, let's yes. He's getting ready to ride a gigantic sandworm. I couldn't find the passage in the book when I reread it, but I thought that they said he was half a league. And when I looked up the distance of a league, it's a nautical term for distance that's three and a half miles. So if he's half a league, he's almost two miles long. Well, you know, like one and three quarters Coming miles. from Caladan, it would make sense that he would use that unit of measurement. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, but, the, but that's just one big ass it is. sandworm. Yeah. Yes, it is. Or maker, or whatever we're going to call him here. But, but I loved, and I think. Yeah, I think that Chris talked about this in his kind of quick take is just the whole mechanics of how the hooks work and how they, you know, pry one of the scales. I can't remember if they call them scales on on the worm. You know, they pry it open. So then it kind of opens this sensitive area. So the worm will roll away from the sand and, you know, try to keep the, the open scale at the highest point. So there's the least amount of irritation. Just the... The whole mechanics of how Herbert wrote that scene. It's just like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Fail, sure, that, that's how you definitely write yeah, a sand If worm. you fail to hook that scale correctly, <laughs> it will roll into the sand and crush you. So don't mess up. Yes. Yeah. And then, like, there was one section yeah. where they, after spoilers, he, he rides the worm, um, where everybody else gets on after mm-hmm. him, and they have, like, a group that are beating on the tail segments at the back of the worm, which cause it to speed up. So it's like you've got like mm-hmm. this worm driver's oh, yeah. ed course baked into this section. So, <laughs> well, and I thought it was interesting too, where I think previously in the book they talked about the southern regions and how it was a twenty yep. thumper trip, and it's like, well, what what does that mean? Well, we find out that it means that it would take you know basically riding twenty different sandworms until they were exhausted. Mm-hmm. Until they got there. So, you know, they would have to use 20 thumpers to get there. That makes a lot of sense. I didn't put that together till now. Thank you. I think that's right. But that, that was, that that's the way I read it. Him. Was, yeah. That they basically, they could ride it till it was exhausted. Because I thought Paul said, you know, that with the size and the strength of this one, they could have ridden it, you know, for a long time. But it would still, they're still far enough away from the southern regions that, you know, it would still be a 20 thumper trip by the time they got there, which I thought well, that was kind of cool too. So, yeah, he rides it and Stilgar comes up beside him. He's like, well, this is your worm. You get to choose where we're going. And like, you know, his his commandos want to go raiding, raid some Harkonnens. But yeah, they want to go. But kill he's Harkonnens. like, no, we're going to go south. 
and Stilgar thinks that he's going south to summon kind of like the leaders to to challenge Stilgar. And Brian, mm-hmm. I think it was you. You're just like, you know what? Just to quote another another property, mm-hmm. this is the way. This mm-hmm. is this is how things happen, and Stilgar knows full well that if Paul yeah. challenges him, Paul will win. And I I think he would probably throw the fight because he believes Paul is the Lisan Al Gaib. That's why I like Stilgar because he he does realize these sorts of things. He understands the gravity of his situation that he is not the the chosen one, and he kind of needs to get out of the way so the chosen one can do the. He's very the, pragmatic like, yes. about it, you know. Just yeah. very. Yep, this is it. This is, yep. this is the role I'm here to play, and this is going to benefit the tribe better in the long run. Well, and then mm-hmm. you get Paul's perspective where he's like, there's got to be a way around this because the, the tribe gets weaker if Stilgar dies, basically. And so the last time mm-hmm. I read this was probably 15 or 20 years ago. And I don't know if it was just me being young or rushing through when i read it but i don't remember stilgar making an impression on me but this read through i'm finding him to be a lot more nuanced and a lot more interesting so Mm -hmm. i wonder if it's an age thing too because i i feel similarly about that that i think the last time i read it was early 2000s i know i read it in college and i read it once in the 80s so i think this is my fourth time through it but you know it's one of those books there's so many layers in the way it's written that you pick up on different things every time you read it. So, yeah, I I would agree, though, that I think I relate more to Stilgar as as a father myself now and, you know, being middle-aged, if that's where I'm still at, you know, that kind of stuff. That I I pick up a lot more on his wisdom and how he approaches life than, you know, I think when I read it when I was younger, you know, it's like, well, this is a story all about Paul. I care about these secondary characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And then the last thing that kind of happens in this section they have to jump off the worm because there's a thopter coming uh not a harkonnen but they they do determine that it's a smuggler thopter and it sounds like they're maybe being driven Mm -hmm. farther south to get the spice probably due to the harkonnens so i'm guessing that's Mm -hmm. going to be a subject for the next section and if we do remember gurney halleck is with the smugglers and I think mm-hmm. Paul had mm-hmm. made a comment that he had seen him with the smugglers before, but Gurney hadn't seen him. So they're they're teasing a reunion. Yeah, well, they end with saying that they're going to, yeah, well, they end because they, you know, the Fedekin really want to kill somebody, right? You know, raid somebody. So now instead of Harkonnens, they're going to bait a patch of sand yeah. and go after the smugglers. Yeah. So. Okay, so we will continue next week. Uh, Thursday afternoon with another episode where we discover what happens next. So if you enjoyed this, please feel free to click the like button. Um, If you have been watching our stuff and you're kind of interested to see where this goes, click the subscribe button. Click the notification bell. That way you get a notification when we post something new. Uh, We also encourage you to use the comment section. We love getting comments. We love responding to comments, whether that is questions comments things you disagreed with things you did agree with things that we didn't mention that maybe you thought were cool we would love to hear about things we could do better yes Mm -hmm. yes yeah maybe that too yeah (laughs) (laughs) a little introspection introspection is good are you are you getting introspective in your old age chip yeah a little bit okay okay just a bit you you interrupted my I digress. Diatribe. Where was I? Anyway, use co- use comments. Just all the things like, that you could leave comments about. Notification bell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all those things that you said. Right. As time. always, we've enjoyed having you. We hope to see you again next time. And until then, I won't see. <laughs>